Okay, so we are going to look at that idea. We are going to first establish the fact that we can literally measure the benefit of a buyer or a group of buyers and measure the benefit of a producer or a group of producers when they participate in the market. And that will be a quantitative measure. And that measure will be very important because if we see for some reason these measured benefits are hard by government intervention, we will say that government intervention is not good. Are we all clear on this? So before we make some kind of policy recommendation, we need to have some tools, some theoretical and quantitative tools that can help us to go there. And that's exactly what we're going to do right now. Okay, what we, what we will see is that whenever there is a, some kind of price ceiling on the market, it is going to you know, have an effect on the economic surplus of the economy, which is the sum of the surplus of the consumer and the sum of the surplus of the producer, where surplus means the benefit of the consumer and the benefit of the producer. When we have a price control, the consumer, the economic surplus of the economy reduces. We don't have enough tool to really appreciate uh, or make that conclusion at this point of time, but we will do it in the next class. What we're going to now do is start building our conceptual framework to understand how we can measure the benefit of a consumer or a producer. This is a very lengthy chapter. If you have any question, please make sure you stop me and ask question. We're going to start with a very you know, uh, in a basic term called surplus. In economics, in English, surplus is a noun which measures something that remains above, uh, beyond what is used or needed. So surplus could be the surplus food that you have um, after you uh, had your dinner. Surplus could be the surplus battery life that you have. Surplus is something that uh, is beyond your usage. Economists use this word surplus very, very regularly. What they use this surplus for is to figure out how people and firms benefit by engaging in transactions in a marketplace. We are going to now define two terms that really summarize the benefit of the consumer and the producer in the economy. Just like so are so many previous definitions where the definition itself is important, these are one of those two definitions. So. Let's read the definitions together. So we're going to start with consumer surplus, where the consumer surplus is the difference between the highest price a consumer is willing to pay for a good and the actual price that the consumer receives. OK? Uh, I'm going to substitute the word receives and use the word pays. It makes more sense. OK? What is that? So let's, try, let's now try to understand this, these two words. The maximum price and the actual price. So what is the maximum price that you are willing to pay? Let's say, let's, let's sort of decompose this idea, right? Let's say you are paying $575 for a Samsung Galaxy 6. Why? That's actually, actually exactly 575 by the way. <laughs> Why? You clearly see that this is an important question, right? We have looked at this question before. We want to remind ourselves as what that means. And we're going to connect this with our current idea. So you are paying $575 for an iPhone, uh, for a Samsung Galaxy Y. Why? Let's start with some simple terms, like, you know, because it's worth it, something like that, right? But we want to sort of understand that, because that's a non-economic term. So what do we mean by something being worthwhile? 
So I am paying $575 because it makes sense for me, right? Remember, in the first two chapters, we established this idea of rationality. We said that a consumer is paying $575 for a cell phone because his uh, benefit of buying that somehow exceeds his cost of buying that or whatever, right? So there is a marginal cost, marginal benefit calculation when you are making a decision of buying a cell phone. So for a buyer, you are, buy, you are paying $575 to buy a cell phone because the benefit of buying that cell phone is $575, isn't that right? That is something that we're going to establish in like two steps. Let me go back. So I am paying $575 for my cell phone because I believe that my cell phone is worth $575. This is how we think about something being worthwhile. So that's my marginal benefit. So what's the cost of buying that cell phone for me? Anyone? Yes, but uh, there is a more important concept that we established when we talked about cost. What is that? What is the cost of buying a cell phone? It's the opportunity cost, right? It's what you give up. Now, remember, in the first couple of chapters, we said that finding opportunity cost is kind of critical because we really don't know what is my best alternative, right? Rather than now, so we are we are way past that uh, opportunity cost concept. Now we are trying to get an idea as to what I give up to buy something, and one could argue that price is what I'm giving up, right? So for me. The marginal cost of buying a cell phone is $575, right? So I now have a measurement of my benefit. I now have a measurement about my cost. Our rationality concept in chapter 2 and 1 says that I will buy this cell phone when the marginal benefit of buying that cell phone is equal to the marginal cost of buying that cell phone. And if I do that, I achieve something that is very central to economics. I achieve efficiency, allocative efficiency. Do you remember that? Okay, so that's interesting. Uh, so when I'm trying to achieve efficiency, I have to somehow compare my marginal benefit and marginal cost. Why is this relevant in chapter 4? They're relevant because we are going to use the same measurement, same concept to measure the benefit of a consumer in a marketplace. So we can start by pointing out that the maximum price that our consumer is willing to pay is the marginal benefit of the consumer. Are we all clear on that? The maximum price that you would be willing to pay if you are rational is equal to the marginal benefit of buying that cell phone. Now, sometimes you can go to Verizon with that $575 to buy that cell phone and you see that Verizon is giving you a sale. It is selling you that cell phone for 300 bucks. So what just happened? You are happy, first of all. <laughs> I paid like $75 for my $575 cell phone. Um, so you are happy because you are getting some kind of benefit. Because there is a market for that. Why are you getting that benefit? Because the market is telling you to pay a price which is less than the price that you were willing to pay. And that is surplus for you. Are we all clear on that? Let's expand this idea. Before we do that, define the producer surplus. The idea of producer surplus is exactly identical with one, one uh, exception. It's for the producer. So just like our consumer, the surplus is the difference between the maximum price that he is willing to pay and the price that he actually pays, how would we characterize the benefit of our producer? Right? In order to understand the producer behavior, we need to go back and figure out how our producer is making decision. So what's the idea? So why would a producer sell something in the market? That actually is quite more intuitive than the consumer side because when we think about consumer, it really is difficult to figure out why do a person pay $575 for a cell phone when you can spend $60 uh, and buy a phone and do the same thing, right? 
For our producer side, it's much more intuitive and probably makes more sense. We could say that our producer's decisions are simpler. Our producer only cares about profit. He will produce something and sell something if he makes profit. Right? So how does he make profit? He produces something and he sells them in the market, gets something called total revenue. He calculates the uh, difference between the total revenue, the stuff that he gets, and cost, the stuff that he spends. The difference is his profit, something that we're going to define uh, a couple of chapters from now. Not right now. So we know that our producer, when he is making decision about whether he's going to produce something or whether he's going to sell that, considers the cost of production. Right? So imagine the price that he receives from the market is less than his cost of production. Would he really sell those and produce those? Would, he, would a producer be willing to produce and sell if the market price is less than his cost of production? Without even understanding the concept of profit, we should understand that the answer is no, right? It doesn't make any sense for our producer to produce something and get a price which is lower than the cost of production. Right? In four chapters from now, we are going to call that a break-even point. In about three chapters, we are going to call it profit. Okay? Are we all clear on this? <laughs> So for our producer, the main consideration is the marginal cost of production, which is the cost of additional unit of output in the market. With that definition, let us now move to the definition of the producer surplus. Producer surplus is the difference between the lowest price the firm would be willing to accept and the price that actually receives. So producer surplus is the difference between the price, the minimum price that he was willing to accept and the price that he actually gets. So the question is, what is the minimum price you would be willing to accept as a producer? Anyone? Somebody said something. Is it like cost? Absolutely right. The minimum price that you would be willing to accept is probably equal to the cost of your production, which just covers your cost, right? In a couple of chapters from now, we are going to call that a zero profit condition, where if the cost of production is equal to the price that you receive, you earn zero profit, but you still produce and supply, right? So the lowest price that our producer is going to be willing to accept is the marginal cost of production, for our producer. Now, let's say you produce burgers. Does anyone know how much it costs for McDonald's to make a Big Mac? You know that, right? It's about 10 cents. It's about 10 cents. It used to be like 5 cents 20 years ago. It has gone up to about 25 cents, you know, 20 cents. Uh, they charge you about $3 for that, right? So there is a huge gap between what it costs for the producer to produce that good and the price that the producer actually gets. This is surplus for the producer. And that's what we're trying to figure out. What the producer gets paid is determined by the market. The producer really don't have any control over that. But producer has, knows what his minimum cost of production is, what his marginal cost is. So what he's going to do, he's going to look at the marginal cost of his production, compare that with the price that he gets. If there is a gap, that he is his producer surplus. So consumer surplus, the gap between the maximum the poor consumer is willing to pay and the price the consumer pays. <coughs> and uh, for the producer, the producer surplus is the minimum price the producer is willing to accept and the price the producer gets. Let's start with the consumer surplus. Start with a very simple example. <coughs> okay. Um, so that's a, this, is an, this is a market where there are a couple of people. You know, you can see their name. Teresa, Tom, Terry, Tim, four people. 
and um, let's start with the situation where the market price is six dollar when the market price is six dollar you can see that only Teresa is buying she's buying one unit no one else is buying because everyone else says I have a lower marginal winning list to pay do you all see that when the market price is five <coughs> Teresa definitely is gonna buy her unit Tom is also going to buy one do you all see that when the market price goes down to four the first two people are definitely going to continue to buy their product and Terry is now going to join now do you all see that so what we see is that as prices go down more and more people buy goods right simple law of demand nothing fancy what is important is to now realize that anytime price changes it changes the consumer surplus of different individuals for example when the market price was six dollar no one was willing to buy anything the only person who was willing to buy a good was Teresa and the maximum price that she was willing to pay was six dollar and the market is also charging her six dollar so when the market price is six there is no consumer surplus because the price that Teresa wanted to pay was six dollar the price Teresa also pays is six dollar do we all see that let us now add the idea of marginal benefit with what we have just discussed right now I am going to think about a traditional supply demand curve that we you know have seen drawing in the previous chapter where we had a demand curve where the demand curve was saying that if the market price is P1 the amount that people wants to buy is Q1 right this is how we interpreted the demand curve I will now switch this statement and I want you guys to pay attention to the way I'm going to reinterpret a demand curve I'm going to make the opposite statement. I'm going to say that if a consumer wants to buy Q1 unit of output, the maximum price our consumer is willing to pay is P1. Does it make sense? If our consumer wants to buy Q1 unit of output, the maximum price our consumer is willing to pay is P1. If you believe that it makes sense, then this demand curve is also the marginal benefit curve of the economy right so we are now taking our demand to a new level we are now saying that our demand curve is not only a demand curve it also keeps track of the marginal benefit of the consumers in the economy because both demand curve and our marginal benefit curve conveys us the same information as market price goes down marginal benefit as market price goes down people buy more and when people buy more people have more marginal benefit so with that we can extend our graphical you know idea by now fix fixing our price so we have seen that as prices go down everyone whose marginal benefit is higher than the market price get some kind of surplus so in order to show that let us fix our price level now let's so in this example our price is three point five dollar so if my price is three point five dollar notice that for Teresa this is TH the hard consumer surplus is this red area do we all see that the difference between what she wanted to pay which was six dollar and if and what she pays which is three point five for Tom his marginal his consumer surplus is the green area so Tom is green make sense for the third person I forgot the name uh, let's use a different color and that will be the consumer surplus of the third person whatever that person is so what what we're doing we are calculating the area below the demand curve and above the market price to calculate consumer surplus for each of these individuals when we add up the green with the red with the blue we get a measurement of consumer surplus for everyone in the economy when we are looking at a more standard 
demand curve like this one, where you, you, you not only have two or three people, but you have a continuum of people. By the way, you should all realize by now that the more people you have, the smoother, smoother is your demand curve, right? Because then those <coughs> stepped up points cannot be distinguished. So if this is the, if this is the standard market demand curve, and $2 is the market price, our consumer surplus is the area below the market demand and above the market equilibrium price. Below market demand, above market equilibrium price. So the entire rectangular area is the area of the consumer surplus. Now if you know A, somehow you know, the information gives you that. And if you know B and you know C, consumer surplus is half times base times height, the area of this rectangle, which is half times base is BC times AC. Now BC is already given, right? BC is 1500. What we do not know is what A is. If somebody gives us the value of A, we can literally calculate the area of this rectangle, which is called consumer surplus of the market. So by using a very trivial mathematical concept, we can now find a quantitative measurement of the benefit of the consumers in this market. Any question? Let us now move to the other side of the market. We are now going to look at, yeah, uh, let's, I, I'm, I'm skipping this, uh, you know, interesting case study. I really like this one, but, you know, I, I don't think there is nothing uh, value added to this. What this economics, uh, economist uh, did what the, was that they calculated, the, collected the data on broadband internet. And what they were able to find, they were able to first estimate a demand curve where they were able to find A, they were able to find B, and they were able to find C. If you know these three points, you can literally calculate the area of the consumer surplus by using the formula that we have just shown. Please take a moment to verify how they calculated that. So 47 by minus 0 is the base. Do we all see that? We are ignoring the zeros because it's not important. And then this is the height. <coughs> A is 73.89, 36 is C, B. So you are calculating A, B. Okay, now let's move on to the producer side of the market. So the producer surplus is, again, a measurement of how much benefit our producers get from the market. It is the difference between uh, the price that, the lowest price that they would be willing to accept and the market price that they actually receive. So lowest price is what we call marginal cost and uh, P is the price they actually receive is the, is the market price. So what we have, um, what we have shown before already is that the lowest price that our producer is willing to accept is called his marginal cost. Um, where marginal cost is the cost of additional production, therefore we can say that the supply curve that we have drawn before can now be interpreted in a slightly different way. So how have we interpreted supply curve? In case of a supply curve, we have said that if the price is P1, the quantity that our supplier is willing to supply is Q1. That's a standard Supply curve, that's a standard law of supply. But if we invert that statement and say that if our producer wants to sell Q1, the minimum price that he will be willing to accept is P1, then this supply curve is nothing but the marginal cost curve for our producer. So our marginal benefit curve and demand curve were identical. Our supply curve and our marginal cost curve are identical. This is extremely important. Why? Because at market equilibrium, as we are going to see in the next class, where demand and supply is equal, 
marginal benefit and marginal costs are also equal, which automatically derives us an allocative efficiency condition that we learned in chapter two. Do you remember that? So we are going to make a very powerful conclusion by saying that in a market equilibrium, the marginal benefit is equal to marginal cost. Hence, market equilibrium gives us efficient allocation of output. Not right now, in the next class. Before we do that, today we need to figure out how to calculate producer surplus. So now we have a producer who produces different quantity and supplies different quantity depending on what the market price is. Imagine when the market price is $1.25, I want to change the color. Um, the amount that our producer wants to sell is $1, one unit. If the market price is $1.25, notice that our producer really doesn't have a surplus. Do you all see that? Because $1.25 is his marginal cost. The price that he gets is also that. So no producer surplus. So no producer surplus. When the market price rises to, let's say, $1.50, the Minimum price our producer was willing to accept was $1.25. The price he gets is $1.50. So this is his producer surplus. Do you all see that? The difference between what he was willing to accept and what he gets is his producer surplus. So we can think about this area being the producer surplus of the first unit. As the market price goes up, this becomes the producer surplus of the second unit, where the first part comes from the first unit, the second part comes from the, so we need to, uh, I apologize, I got carried away. Let me recolor them. So when the market price is $1.50, this, the green area is the producer surplus. When the market price rises to, let's say $1.75, we are going to see two different areas. The first area is the producer surplus associated with supplying the first unit. Do we all see that? For the first unit, this is the price that he was willing to accept. That's the price he gets. So that's the producer surplus of the first unit. For the second unit, the price that he was willing to accept was $1.50. The price he gets is $1.75. So this is the producer surplus of the second unit. This is the producer surplus of the first unit. But together, they are the producer surplus by selling two units in the market. So as prices rise, producer surplus rise. In the consumer case, as prices fall, consumer surplus rise. Do you see that? For a more smoother supply curve, like this one, the producer surplus is the area, the producer surplus is the area below the market equilibrium price and above the supply curve. The producer surplus is the area below the market equilibrium price and above the supply curve. This is also a triangle. If you know what A, B, and C is, you can literally calculate the area of the producer surplus, just like we did for the consumer. I have two minutes. In that two minutes, I want to first ask you whether you have any question as how we calculated consumer surplus and producer surplus. If not, let us summarize what we have just covered. We have covered two things. We have covered consumer surplus and we have covered producer surplus. We want to conclude today by pointing out that our consumer surplus is basically a net benefit to the consumer, not total benefit. Consumer surplus is the difference between how much you wanted to pay and how much you actually pay and pay, end up paying. So it's like a net benefit to you. So consumer surplus is the net benefit of the market, of the consumers, and producer surplus is the net benefit received by our producers. Thank you very much. <laughs>